Hello Internet. So today I'd like to do a video on the topic of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as somebody who's interested in philosophy, I find the idea of universal human rights a complex one in the sense that human rights are not part of the nature of things. They're not part of the universe. They are values that we make up and we try and convince other people of them. They're aspirational and to a certain extent they're personal. They're, they're not something where you can have a any kind of an empirical method to find them. And so the notion that they exist or don't exist, I don't think they're of a category where that fits. Um, but they're declarations, and that's fine. And so here, what I'm hoping to do is to look into the the declaration and just go uh, part by part down it and to give some thoughts as to why you might like or dislike some of the parts of it. And the reason I'm doing this is not to attack the idea of human rights. I think that they're a useful if overused and often misused way to approach uh, interests and principles that we think uh, people should be able to live by, government should be structured by, things of that sort. And I think that they're a great tool provided that we enter to them without any ideas of natural rights, which are largely stupid. The idea of natural rights is that somehow rights are embedded into the nature of the universe and the people arguing for them never really give you a way to find them they just kind of say well it is and then they tell you why they like them and they do they basically put on airs about the the origin of these things and never justify them i don't think they're justifiable um because there's just no method of constructing them that's um that's objective so we can, I think that we can essentially discard the notion of natural rights. But if we, if we see these things as being as built by aesthetic arguments and built by experience, we look at the, uh, all the different legal systems and all the different principles behind them and try and find something that feels good and non-problematic based on our values, it's a way of understanding ourselves and a way of trying to persuade others that our values are attractive but it is aesthetic, philosophically aesthetic in nature. I'm going to skip over the preamble because uh, a general principle I hold is that preambles are poetry. They're not meant to be taken as content. Um, they're often very fluffy and they people don't refer to them when they're looking to see how, how things work. Usually, sometimes they can give you a certain flavor as to interpretation of the concrete bits, but in themselves, they're useless. So let's move on. Article one, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. I think we're going to focus on the first part of that because the second part is is kind of vague and a little bit poetic. Um, but the idea that all human beings are born free, um, the idea that all human beings are born free, I think I I think I can get be, uh, behind that. I can't think of any counter uh, counter examples of that that I like. Um, I think it's fine for now to focus on humans. Equal in dignity. Uh, dignity is not a particularly well-defined term. I suggest we discard it because it's pretty much meaningless. Um, if somebody were to try and build something concrete on top of a notion of, of dignity, then we can have a conversation. But in this wording, I see it as, as meaningless fluff. And then on a, the idea of all human beings are born equal in rights, I think the, the the best exceptions I can find to that, or the best shortcomings in this phrasing, however you want to think about it, is the notion of people who are citizens having uh, more rights in the place where uh, where they have citizens. I'm comfortable with that, and so I would say that that has to be 
a limit on Article One for uh, for it to be acceptable. I believe that nation sh uh, it's if they want to have citizenship, uh, and I I like the idea of uh, of citizenship. Although maybe if I, we lived in a different world that were very differently arranged, I'd be comfortable with it not being there. But in the world we live in now, I like the idea of citizenships and nations being primarily interested in the well-being of their citizens. I think that having citizens have more rights is fine, natural, and normal. Moving on to Article 2. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this, this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political, uh, or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political, jurisdictional, or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent, trusts, non-self-governing, or under any other limitation of sovereignty. Now, this one is hard to evaluate on its own because uh, depending on what rights are, are coming afterwards, we, uh, we might or might not agree. It's basically giving a context for interpretation of everything else. Um, in general, I think you know, rights and freedoms, race, color, sex, language, blah, blah, blah. trying to find anything that, uh, that really seems objectionable in terms of the ideas later. Um, National or social origin, again, I think that we need to carve out the idea that it is fine for rights to be somewhat dependent on someone being in the area where they're a citizen or not. Um, no distinctions will be made on the basis of the country to which a person belongs. So basically, there, uh, what I think the second part is saying is that, uh, for example, if, if you're part of an area that is a non-independent uh, possession of another country, that doesn't effectively limit your rights. And I think that seems generally okay. Article 3. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Um, this seems a little too short. I would uh, certainly, when people are in jail, they're going to not have uh, rights to liberty. And I know that there's a lot of important discussion to be had about people uh, being in, in prison for having broken laws and what laws are just and things like that. This kind of dodges that whole question, but I don't think you can dodge it. So I, I think we have to set that topic aside and say that Article 3 cannot be commenting on that topic, um, at least in order to move on from it. Security of person... Uh, I think there are always some nuances around that. Um, when the well-being of other people touches on the uh, security of one's person, again, depending on what that means. Um, right to life, does this mean no death penalties anywhere? Um, so criminal law is really not well handled in this. Let's move on to Article 4. No one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery in the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. I'm entirely on board with that. Uh, without, um, really without uh, much else to say on that. I, I agree with the UN Universal Declaration there. No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. I'm generally on board with this. Uh, this does seem to be moving more closely to treatment of people who are in jail. I'm entirely against torture, uh, as much as I note that it can be hard to define. Um, I think depending on how cruel and human or degrading is interpreted, Article 5 could be problematic. Um, like uh, somebody could even say like you, you can't put people in jail because it's cruel. And so we need to have a certain amount of reasonabili uh, reasonability and in interpretation. But in general, the text of this, I don't have a problem with, provided that it's interpreted by someone reasonable. Article 6, everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. And I think what this is meant to do is to critique the notion, maybe, uh, that some legal systems, including 
uh, a lot of Western legal systems had a status of someone being an outlaw where they essentially had no legal rights and anybody could do whatever they wanted to them. Generally for some heinous, cri uh, heinous crime, if somebody were declared an outlaw, then that was the state of things. I think that that is probably what Article 6 is talking about. Um, and if so, um, I think I'm okay with that. Uh, it's not something I, I necessarily feel very strongly about. I could uh, Maybe there there could be room for that notion somewhere, but uh, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd need to think about it a, a lot. That's, uh, that's something where I haven't really thought about it very much and I've not worked out my thoughts. Um, I think one of the problems I, I have with the outlaw concept is we don't want the punisher to have in themselves the kind of cruelty that you would need to really abuse somebody because they're an outlaw. I don't think that uh, we should permit that in society. It's not just about whether the person deserves it, but whether we can tolerate the act itself. And so that's a good argument against um, against outlaw status. Uh, but yeah, there's interesting conversations to be had there. Article 7. All are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. All are entitled to equal protection against any discrimination and violation of this declaration and against any incitement to, dis to such discrimination. Um, I think I have some problems with Article 7. The, the it, and a lot of it comes down to what it means to discriminate, what kinds of discrimination are legally relevant or in principle relevant for this declaration. Um, is it saying that uh, uh, like, like employees versus non-employee access to bathrooms, that's if you really want to go with incredibly broad notions of discrimination, that might qualify even having separate re restrooms for uh, males and females that might qualify. And I'm actually okay with both of those discriminations. Um, uh, so w what does it mean? Uh, and, and I guess being entitled to protection against incitement to such discrimination, if you interpret this too broadly, then this damages free speech. Uh, if you just interpret it to like immediate incitement, then maybe it's okay. But again, it depends on what discrimination means. I think Article Seven needs a lot of clarifications, uh, and I'm not—I wouldn't accept it as it is. Article Eight: Everyone has the right to an effective remedy by the competent national tribunals for acts violating the fundamental rights granted by uh, him by the Constitution or by law. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree that rights are granted by legal structures rather than in, intrinsic to the nature of things, although that almost kind of undercuts uh, the Universal Declaration. Um, but do you have rights to an effective remedy? Uh, I, I guess the problem is who, who decides. Um, it, and is is that judgment usually very clear? Uh, you're going any system of judgment is going to make that uh, that kind of mistake. And often fundamental rights, well, not often, but sometimes they bump into each other. Uh, Article eight sounds broadly acceptable, like it's basically uh, in in a certain sense, it's saying rule of law for the important fundamental stuff. Uh, so I guess. Broadly, I can accept the intuition. Um, I'm not sure if I would always agree with it as a effective remedy. Article nine, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. And there we get into questions of what does arbitrary mean? Uh, and sometimes people are arrested for their own protection. Sometimes they want to be arrested for their own protection, although that's kind of rare. Um, but, uh, arbitrary detention, ar arbitrary exile, um, in general, I like the principle here. Um, I might wonder what arbitrary means and whether it would stomp on something that I see as reasonable. Um, and I, th I think potentially one could imagine very short term, uh, arrests, uh, 
and, and, and to, uh, to hold somebody, it might not be that uh, abusive. And sometimes it might be a good idea in situations where somebody, in, in situations of crisis, but in general, I like, uh, I think article nine is decent. Article 10, everyone is entitled in full equality to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal in the determination of his rights and obligations of any, and of any criminal charge against him. Um, I think that is one way to run a legal system. It's, it's one acceptable way, way. I think there's a number of not, uh, unacceptable ways. By unacceptable, I mean ones that I wouldn't accept, ones that I would see as unjust. Um, but the idea that it, uh, it must be done by a tribunal uh, is a little excessively narrow. Again, I like the intuition. I'm wary of accepting it as a strong principle. Article 11 has two parts. First part. Everyone charged with a penal offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proven, uh, oh, they said proved, until proven guilty according to law in a public trial at which he has had all the guarantees necessary for his defense. Um, again, I think innocent until proven guilty, not proved, is a good principle. Um, I, there might be other imaginable good principles, but I think this, it's a pretty solid one. Uh, in a public trial, I think generally public trials are a good idea. Um, there might be some exceptions at, uh, at which he has had all the guarantees necessary for his, def his defense in general. Yeah, I think this is good. There, there are some cases where, for example, people in the military, uh, they might, uh, I don't know if military courts are normally public or not. I, th I think they're not in the U.S. And I'm generally okay with that. Um, although, I mean, th that's somebody voluntarily entering into an area where they uh, are entering into a profession. Although it is a long-term profession and we might be justly worried about the fate of people who have spent their whole career in this and to be... Um, put in an unfair court that nobody can even see, uh, you, you, despite the choice. But in general, I, I like the principle. Second part, no one shall be held guilty of any penal offense on account of any act or omission which did not con constitute a penal offense under national or international law at the time w uh, when it was committed, nor shall a heavier penalty be imposed than the one that was applicable at the time the penal offense a penal offense was committed. So what this is getting at is, uh, and this is also a principle in American law, uh, it, you had, uh, I believe it's called ex post facto, which is the notion that uh, if if after the fact that the law was established, then the person should not be held accountable to something that was not illegal or not as illegal at the time. I know as illegal is something that's going to make any lawyer cringe, but you know what I mean. Um, and I could rephrase it uh, in a way that you would probably like a little bit better. Uh, but it's uh, bas uh, basically saying you, you can't piece together a stronger motive for punishing people than was available at the time. This works a little bit better with legal systems that are um, more civil law rather than common law. Now, common law is not particularly friendly to the idea, but it's, uh, but laws are a little bit more flexible in, in common law than they are in civil law. And uh, stare decisis uh, means you, you rely on precedent and clarification of things that you claimed were always law. Uh, I know that I'm breaking with the established terminology, but I'm intentionally doing so about how people normally talk about it. Now, in terms of actual, the treating this criminally, yeah, it maybe doesn't come up uh, all that often. And it might be actually hard to think of a case where it would come up. Um, in general, I think that's a fine principle. It doesn't really solve the problem of things that get into legal gray areas. And, um, and I don't think this principle can or should be used to stomp on the notion of those gray areas being real. 
but I think in general, it's a good principle. I think properly limited, I'm okay with it. Article 12, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home or correspondence, nor to attacks upon his honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference and attacks. Now, here we have to break it apart. Arbitrary interference is uh, a tricky standard. You'd have to figure out what, it, what arbitrary means. Does it mean not in accor accordance with existing law? Uh, does it mean that we're getting rid of the judgments used? For example, if a social worker, in accordance to, to law, uh, believes that a existing family relationships of some sort don't are not for the best interests of, of the children, can they separate them? Is that arbitrary interference? Um, if it amounts to arbitrary interference, then I'm for the possibility of arbitrary interference with family. Um, so I'm, I'm wary of how this idea might be applied. Arbitrary interference with correspondence, if there's some reason to believe that, uh, corresp that somebody might be dangerous, then intelligence ag agencies might wiretap them. And I think that is potentially okay. I'm not, uh, not super bothered by it. Um, attacks on honor and reputation I think there we should be very, very limited in the protections that Article 12 should provide. Um, again, it's a free speech concern, and maybe we can have laws about libel and slander, but they should be reasonably limited. Uh, they should be limited to things that are factually false, or maybe a small extension beyond that, but not broad. If, if you think the mayor is a jerk, or if you think this, uh, my, uh, my neighbor is, uh, uh, I don't know, has really bad breath or, or something like that. Um, I, I think people should have the right to say these things. And I, I don't think the protection of law against too broad a notion of reputation or particularly honor is desirable. So I'm, pretty skeptical as a whole of Article 12. I, I think first parts need cl clarification and that honor and reputation part, it's really dangerous to free speech. I'm not on board with it. Article 13, everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how to interpret this. I'm hoping it's not calling for open borders everywhere. I'm not on board at all with that. I don't think nations have the obligation to accept uh, people in any circumstance. Uh, I think they have the right to close their borders. I think they have the right to set policy for entrance to their borders. And in certain much, much more limited uh, circumstances to uh, for exits to their borders. Uh, so yeah, I'm not uh, but again, I might be misinterpreting that, but if I'm interpreting it correctly, I entirely disagree with it. Uh, everyone, uh, second part, everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. Uh, I can imagine some circumstances where we might limit this. Um, if people have debts and they're fleeing to escape the debts, if people have childcare agreements, they're fleeing with kids to escape that. and. During times of emergency, there might be reasonable limits to egress. Um, and I do not at all agree on a right to return to one's country. Uh, so Ar Article 13, I think that's another one where I just, I don't agree at all with, or I, certain, I don't think I really agree with any of the intuitions behind it. Um, might have some symp sympathy in general for the right to leave countries. Uh, not in emergencies, but in general, yeah. Article 14, everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. Uh, I think they have the right to seek, but enjoy, nope. I don't think there's any right to get asylum, and I think countries are entirely within their rights to refuse it. This might be, may not be invoked in the case of persecutions generally arising from non-political crimes or from acts, Contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations, what they're basically saying there is that you can't 
look to be free from persecution if uh, if the persecution is for a crime. I don't think that's good enough. I I, I think I just enti I entirely disagree with the intuitions behind Article 14. Article 15. Everyone has the right to a nationality, and nobody shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality, nor denied the right to change his nationality. Um, I'm not sure what Article 1 really mean, uh, or with what Part 1 of Article 15 really means, and the right to a nationality. Does that mean somebody has to give it to you, or just that you, in the abstract, have a right? But, uh, yeah, that, that feels meaningless and being arbitrarily deprived. Again, if arbitrary just means not in uh, alignment with existing law or policy, then fine, fine. That, uh, but if it means uh, you can't have laws that would strip somebody of their nationality, I'm not sure what to think about that. I think certainly if, if you wanted to go after someone legally and so you strip them of their, their nationality, in order to lessen their rights, but you don't intend to boot them out. That's a problem. And in terms of being denied the right to change one's nationality, I I don't think I necessarily agree with that. I think it's fine for countries to say, we're always going to treat you as, as a citizen. You can't change that. Uh, I don't really object to that. Um, not saying they should do it, but anyhow, let's move on. Article 16. Men and women of full age, without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion, shall have the right to marry and to found a family. They're entitled to equal rights as to marriage, during marriage, and at its dissolution. Um, I think race, nationality, or religion. Um, I think with those limitations, I believe I'm fine with it. Uh, I, I think if it's if it's meant to exclude any possible limitations, then I'm not fine with it. Somebody, people who are deeply mentally ill, uh, people who have developmental disorders and never really reach the mental state of adulthoods, we might not think that they should uh, should get married because they're essentially are, are to be treated as children or not mentally competent. I'm fine with limits. Um, also, people who are in jail, I don't think that they necessarily should. I don't, yeah, I generally don't think if, if you're in jail, you should have the right to get married while you're in jail or to found a family while you're in jail. Um, I, I'm not, I don't generally believe in marital rights for prisoners. Uh, um, during marriage, uh, but, but there is a little bit in here about men and women having equal rights as to marriage during marriage and at dis dissolution. I'm, I'm all for that. Um, but I think that, yeah, there can be reasonable limits and this seems to, uh, be a little bit un unclear on that. Second part, marriage shall be entered into only with the free and full consent of the intending spouses. Sounds good. I would actually add a few more limits to that in that I think that both intending spouses should be financially independent, not wards of their family. Uh, so having a higher marriage limit, uh, age limit, and having some financial requirements uh, to make sure that people really have that, uh, the effective freedom to end a marriage that they don't want and that they're entering into it with eyes open and it's not arranged by their families. I think that that would be good. I would extend this further, actually. Uh, third part, family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. Again, depending on what that means, I'm fine with it. Article 16, I think broadly, with, a, with apart from some areas where it doesn't comment, I think Article 16 doesn't go far enough. I would want some more protections to prevent there being a cultural pipeline to push people into marriage. But in general, yeah, Article 16, I'm generally on board with it, should go further. Article 17, everyone has the right to own property alone as well as in association with others and nobody shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property. Uh, yeah, sound, sounds unobjective, uh, unobject unobjectionable as stated. Um, there might be some possible misapplications of this, but in general, I, I don't see any issue with it as stated. 
Article 18. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his freedom or belief, and freedom, either alone or in a community with others and in public or private, to manifest his rel religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. I would prefer to phrase this as a largely negative right, in the sense that nations should not look to stomp out religions purely based on their ideas, but I think it can be reasonable to restrict things that happen to be part of a religious practice so long as it's not done with the intent to stomp out a religion. Uh, the reasoning for this is that I don't believe people should be able to get essentially special rights by claiming that certain actions are part of their religion and and therefore they get deference for those actions. I, I don't think that that's a reasonable interpretation uh, reasonable thing for society to permit. So I would modify Article 18 along those grounds. I'm not comfortable with it as stated. Uh, it's possible to interpret it in the direction that I I would like, but I think that it's not the only reasonable interpretation, so I, I don't think I like the phrasing as it is. Article 19, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and, and of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. I generally like this. Um, it does. It actually goes broader than the First Amendment in the U.S. because it it puts obligations on media not to stomp on freedom of expression uh, and opinion. Um, I think though that there we're getting into some areas where there might be some reasonable compromise. I think platforms should set reasonably clear and ideally fairly political neutral rules about what they'll accept and what they won't. And if they're relatively politically neutral, then we're good. If they're not, then I think we have a problem and it's fine to look to regulate that. Um, but in general, I actually, uh, with the caveat that I think that there are some nuances to explore, I like this a little bit better than the U.S. First Amendment. I realize that that might be a rather bold thing to say, and I might eventually, on thinking on it, back off from that, but I'm certainly chewing on it right now. I think it's, it's a really solid principle, despite having some things to work out. Article 20, everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. No one may be compelled to belong to an association. Um, I Second part is really unobjectionable. First part, uh, yeah, I think in, in the general case, again, you could have some emergencies where, uh, again, pandemic policy uh, and uh, or in times of war, things like that, you might have to limit these things. But in general, I think it's a great principle for normal times. Article 21, everyone has the right to take part in the government of his country directly or through freely chosen representatives. Um, this mandates political pluralism. Poli political pluralism is something that I like. I, uh, I support it. I'm not entirely sure that there could not be a form of government that is not representative and pluralist uh, that, that I'd be into, but... Um, it at least describes one f broad form of government that I am a big booster of. Um, second, everyone has the right of equal access to public service in his country. I'm a little bit wary of this because there are circumstances where people just might not be effectively able because of different physical or other capabilities of holding certain jobs. If you're a pacifist and you want to be a foot soldier um, and you ex expect accommodation for your pac pacifism, that's not going to work too well. Um, if you are disabled and in a wheelchair and you expect to be a fighter pilot, that might be pretty expensive to make that kind of thing work. Um, I So accommodation makes this tricky. Um, it's a nice broad principle, but I think it needs to be thought of not as an absolute right, but as 
something where we think about accommodation. There might be some other areas where I'd not be okay with it, but in general, I think it's a nice principle, provided that it's interpreted reasonably rather than taken as absolute. Third part of Article 21, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government that shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures. Again, this describes some things that I broadly like. I'm not sure that they're the only way to do things. Um, for example, in theory, you could have broad plebiscites rather than representative governments. And, uh, and so there wouldn't exactly be elections in such a system. And uh, although I think that would be an unwieldy system of government, nobody actually is really doing it to my knowledge. Um, I, I don't think I have any ethical or moral objections to it. Um, this also really specifies again, um, political, uh, pluralism and representative democracy, which is what we have in the U S and in a lot of other, uh, Western countries. I like it. I often think it's better than the alternatives, but I would not be willing to write out the possibility of there being some other form of government that we haven't thought of that might be, uh, that I might like as well, or might find otherwise decent or maybe even better. So it's good. Might be over specific. Article 22. Everyone as a member of society has the right to social security and is entitled to realization through national effort and international cooperation in accordance with the organization and resources of each state of the economic, social and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of his personality. This is not talking about the US institution of social security, I don't believe. I think it's talking about security in society and uh, talking about being, I think, materially supported enough to have dignity and free development of personality. This is a little bit too airy for me. I don't think I can agree with it just because I don't know. I don't really know what it means and I'm wary of a broad interpretation. It, it also, it just feels like it's coming from a way of thinking about these things. It's a little too alien to me. I'm worrying, I'm worried about how this would be interpreted. It might sound nice, but uh, Article 22, eh, I wouldn't commit to it. Article 23, everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work and to protection against, I gotta go through this in parts, protection against unemployment. These sound like good social programs. Free choice of employment, again, somebody's specifics might, might not mesh with available jobs. If everybody in society wants to be a dentist, then that's not going to work. Um, and just and favorable conditions of work. That's again, pretty vague. So, uh, I can't, can't really agree to it. It's just too vague. Article 23, part two, everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work. Uh, I think I broadly agree. I, I worry about difficulties in enforcing this well. Um, but I think it's a nice principle. Article 23, part three, everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplanted if necessary by other means of social protection. Uh, again, I think this is a nice principle. I think I actually am much more on board with this one than I am with the previous statements. Um, again, human dignity is kind of a fluffy concept, but in general, I think this is a, a good, good statement. Article, Article 23, part four, everyone has the right to form and to join trade unions for the protection of his interests. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that that's broadly Fine. There are some questions which I don't have a great answer to as to whether, like, for example, public sector trade unions should be permitted. There are also inefficiencies that are brought about by trade unions, depending on how they act. But in general, I think I'm on board with this. Article 24, everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitation of working hours and periodic holidays with pay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I'm on board with that. Article 25, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary 
social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in, com in circumstances beyond his control. Um, I think I like the vision this has for society. The notion of structuring it as a right effectively though it, it creates problems for relatively market or oriented approaches to these things and i don't really want to rule those out um it uh, it's not necessarily about ruling that but it certainly complicates it um so yeah article 25 part one is its phrasing is problem, problem, potentially problematic, even though its vision for society I'm on board with. Um, Article 25, Part 2, motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance. All children, whether born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same social protection. Um, I think that that's fine. I think it, it is in society's interests to ensure to a certain degree the well-being of children, even potentially to the exclusion of uh, parents wanting more control. Uh, uh, I'm on board with it, except I'm a little wary of, you could conceivably have single fathers uh, caring for children. So, uh, sometimes mothers die in childbirth or sometimes fathers end up being uh, better parents or, or whatever. I'm, I'm where it seems a weird thing to omit in article 20 uh article 25 but certainly the focus should be on the children the, but the focus on motherhood rather than parenthood i i would adjust that wording article 26 everyone has the right to education education shall be free at least in the elementary and fundamental stages elementary education shall be compulsory technical and professional education shall be made generally available and higher education shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of merit um Yes, I am on board with that. I am for a limited time willing to accept some tweaking of the equally accessible part on the basis of making up for past historical adjustments, but I think we're getting near the end of when that's reasonable in the US. I think in other countries or with other specifics, it could be justified for a limited time, but in the longer term, uh, differences in access to higher education um, should uh, should eventually fade. Article 26, Part 2, education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, shall promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, racial or religious groups, and shall further the, the activities of the United Nations for the maintenance of peace. The phrasing in here is really weird. Uh, suggesting that education should be dot, 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 furthering the activities of the UN. That feels a little proprietary. Uh, that language should be chopped out. Um, friendship among all nations needs a lot of nuance because sometimes nations are being pretty aggressive and you don't always want to have them do something unjust and then, oh, we're promoting friendship and tolerance. So we should have education be pushing people against any response to unacceptable acts. Um, and again, human rights and fundamental freedoms are always kind of airy, nebulous things and strengthening of respect for them could be problematic. Um, so I'm not necessarily on board with Article 26, Part 2. Um, art, art, uh, part 3, parents shall have a prior right to choose the kinds of education that shall be given to their children. I'm giving that a nope. No way. Uh, parents are, don't own their children. They don't get to craft everything about the lives of their children. Um, I, I generally think that the state gets a shot because the state is acting for broader society and children should not generally be indoctrinated by parents that happen to be in weird ide ideas, or at least they shouldn't be only the only people who get to feed ideas into their kids. We shouldn't have pipelines that can be constructed in society where uh, strange groups with really strange beliefs can effectively inoculate children all the way up until adulthood 
with only being exposed to their own ideas. And then in adulthood, they're already largely set on their ways. So no, I, I don't think parents should have a prior right to choose the kind of education that should be given to, to kids. Uh, absolutely disagree. Um, Article 27, everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. That's part one. Um, I think that this could be problematic depending on what cultural life of the community means. In that if you have, let's say for example, you have a, a country that's largely Roman Catholic, like say 80%, and the Roman Catholics have their own festivals and stuff. I don't think that that necessarily obliges them to allow, uh, I mean, if these, if these are privately run festivals, privately funded, etc., I don't think that that means that people who are not Roman Catholic should automatically get a right to take part in those things. Uh, I think having associations of various sorts means that you're going to have potentially some limits, even of very pr powerful private actors. And this gets a little fuzzy because if it ends up being a stranglehold, then you can effectively lock people out of economic life. And so there's a potentially, in some imaginable circumstances, there's a tension there that needs to be explored. But I don't think we should just flat out prohibit large associations that, uh, that are a little selective. Everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, li literary or artistic production of which he is the author. No, I'm not willing to accept a fundamental right to intellectual property. Nope. Uh, I generally don't believe in intellectual property. I accept that it's part of the legal system which I live, but it's not something that I see as a fundamental right. And I don't appreciate uh, this part, which is jamming it into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So nope. Article 28. Everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. Having read the rights and freedoms set forth in the declaration, I'm saying no. Um, there are problematic ideas in here, and uh, I, I don't think that uh, accepting a uh, doubling down on, on, on them is acceptable. If, if they were really carefully replumbed, then maybe, but as is, no. Article 29. Everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. Uh, oh, that's part one. Uh, I accept this as a broad principle. Yes, we have duties to society. Article 29, part two. In the exercise of his rights and freedoms, everyone shall be subject only to such limitations that are determined by law solely for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others. Um, and of meeting the just requirements of morality, public order, and the general welfare in a democratic society. Um, this is basically saying that any laws need to be justified by one of three measures, either morality, public order, or the general we uh, welfare. I think that's too narrow. I could imagine other things that could could be valid laws. So I'm, I'm giving that a no. Uh, Article 29, part three, these rights and freedoms may in no case be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. I'm giving that a no. That again feels very oddly proprietary. Uh, so yeah, absolutely not. Article 30, and this is the last one. Nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as implying for any state, group, or person any right to engage in, a, in any activity or to perform any act aimed at the destruction of any of the rights and freedoms set forth herein. Uh, this goes against some fairly strong free, free speech principles, so I'm giving that another strong no. Article 30 is unacceptable, uh, so nope. So in any case, those are my... Um, those are my thoughts on the 30, 30 articles that I that are at least present right now on the UN website as their Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are some pretty pro problematic things in there. There are some good things in there too. But as stated now, um, I, I think I, I would oppose these as being broadly adopted as right for everyone and fully thought out and decent. 
So in any, uh, any case, those are my thoughts. If you have any comments, we can chat about it. I'll try and keep an eye on the comments. Uh, I might miss some notifications, but I'll try not to. Uh, but your thoughts are welcome. Bye-bye.